Um, so today I'll just be showing you some of the work we've done um, on the continental scale um, Badlands models that uh, cover Australia and PNG. So this is work that has been ongoing over the past few years as part of my PhD and we've recently submitted um, to basic research. So with these Badlands models, um, we've been trying to reproduce the flooding history and resulting sediment packages um, for comparison to the real world basins and um, the parameters such as sea level and dynamic topography that influence these patterns. Uh, and so that's why we focused on the Great um, Artesian Basin in Eastern Australia, um, as it's relatively tectonically quiet um, compared to the complexity of PNG. Um, and we've also got a lot of real world data that we can compare to and, and kind of ground truth and test whether our models are performing well. So, so in the Great Artesian Basin, we've got about a kilometre of um, shallow marine sediments deposited during the early Cretaceous, so part of the Rolling Downs group in particular. Um, and these were deposited during the widespread flooding of the continent um, during the early Cretaceous that has generally been considered out of sync with euthostatic sea level. Um, and so this has usually been um, in relation to the half sea level curves. Um, I'm not sure how well the colours come out in the slideshow, but this light grey uh, sea level curve here, uh, while our main Aramanga Sea flooding event seems to be happening when we're getting this dip uh, in sea level. And previous work has actually attributed this um, discrepancy to dynamic topography, um, particularly the migration of eastern of Australia over subducted material um, from the Eastern Gondwana subduction zone. Um, and you can see that some of our, our catalogue of dynamic topography models all tend to have this uh, dynamic substance coming across at this time, uh, kind of perhaps offsetting um, that sea level um, discrepancy. And so with the Pine Badlands models, we incorporate um, obviously the sea level and dynamic topography, uh, but we also incorporate uplift from tectonic um, events. Um, we have rainfall incorporated, so we use the Harrington et al. Um, values for, for this set of models. We incorporate sediment compaction um, and an initial topography that has been derived from a, uh, the Geoscience Australia uh, paleogeography from 150 MA, which is our model start time. Uh, so with uh, the models that we've been doing recently, um, incorporating dynamic topography, we've really been looking at uh, the difference in the Buzanesque approximation models and the extended Buzanesque approximations. So in our initial testing, we found that almost no matter what we did, the Vuzanes approximations had such a high amplitude wave of dynamic topography that we were always getting almost too much flooding and particularly at the present day as Australia continued to move um, eastward, our final time step would often have Western Australia just totally submerged. Um, that's why we started testing the extended Vuzanes models, which um, is this you can see on the right hand side here um, and for this point within the Aramanga Basin you can see it's quite a lot lower amplitude during the early Cretaceous and what we've also done um, has we, we've combined this with testing the hybrid sea level curve um, that yeah, it's based on the Hark, Hark curves and uh, the a new ocean basin volume curve from 2018 um, that DMR published, which has a sea level peak that's actually earlier in the Cretaceous, um, which somewhat differs from that out of sync idea. So we've got a couple of different competing ideas that we were trying to test in this model, um, in a series of models. Um, and so what we, we did was we just did, a, for this set of models, everything remained consistent. We then combined the business approximations with the 
course, um, sea level curve. Um, what we found was that we didn't have a significant difference between hybrid um, long-term and hybrid short-term um, sea level curves. Uh, but we did find a significant difference when we tested the ocean basin volume curves um, uh, with both the Buzanesque and um, extended Buzanesque models. Um, I'll just see if I'm running out of time. Our preferred model um, is M4. So this is just a quick snapshot of the paleogeographies uh, through time extracted from the model, a little rather than predicted topography. Uh, our preferred model has a reasonable match um, to the, the timing of inundation. We find that when we've tested the ocean basin curve with the Rusinesque models, we almost get too much flooding. It lasts for a lot longer um, and it becomes the basins a lot deeper. Overall, the sediment thicknesses are, are reasonable between the models. For models where we just tested ocean, um, the sea level without any diamond topography applied, we as expected, it got very little deposition in the basin, and that's these two um, down here. Whereas all the other models are kind of giving us a very similar um, sediment thickness. We tried to look at some sediment cross sections so we could kind of break down the timing. Um, again, there's not a huge amount of difference in these sediment cross sections um, at first glance. Um, one thing is that we tend to get a different location in the main depot center between um, the, the models. But what, um, I'll try and hurry through these results. It, what we found most interesting to look at recently is the synthetic wells or rather where we've tried to extract the, um, the uh, a proxy for the depositional environment from our badlands models. So there's no grain size um, that is modeled within Pi Badlands. So instead we use the paleo water depth at the time of deposition. Um, and we can compare that between all of our models. And then we've compared that with a stacked paleogeographic column um, from Strachmar and Tottenham. So that is where we've stacked the paleogeographies on top of each other. Uh, and then at a particular location, we've extracted at each one million year interval, um, what the depositional environment was. So the main ones we're looking for here is marine shallow, marine very shallow and the fluvial units. And you can see that in our first three models, which um, were all the uh, Brusinesque approximation models, um, oh, sorry, Brusinesque and extended Brusinesque with hybrids or traditional sea level curve, pretty much produced no sediment, um, marine sediment in the basin or very little. When we apply the ocean basin volume curve is when we get these nice thick um, sh shallow marine sediments. Um, if we're just looking at the combined high amplitude from the business approximations and the ocean basin curves, we get a basin that is far too deep and, and far too thick of, um, of the sediments. So that's kind of been a very quick rush through all of these results. Um, and we're kind of hoping to quantify these better going back to working with the experimental design that I've done with Greg and Ritu at Curtin University um, for some of our future work. But these models have just been progressively trying to improve on over the last few years. Um, so yeah, that's... Thanks for listening in. Thanks for everyone's help who's inputted to the project. Um, I guess I'll give it back to you, Rianne.